Watch a movie, get inspired, give back, help a charity. It's time for a movie karma watch party. Hi, everybody. I'm Jared Milrad, uh, the founder of Movie Karma. Welcome to another Movie Karma watch party uh, today. We're really excited to have uh, some very special guests that we celebrated as part of our monthly A Show for a Change film festival. This is a social impact film festival where we celebrate socially conscious filmmakers around the world who are harnessing the power of story for good. Um, so today's special guests, uh, we have Greg Lovett and Matthijs Heismans. I hope I got that close to right. Um, they're the filmmakers uh, behind an incredible film called 12th Street uh, that we're gonna screen in part uh, today for about 25 minutes and then do a Q and A afterwards. So welcome to both of you guys uh, and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, if folks have questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A as we go. And we'll, uh, we'll chat at, on the back end here. Thanks so much uh, for, for sharing your film with us, uh, Greg and Matthias. I'm really excited to talk to you about 12th Street. Uh, again, thanks everybody for, for listening in. If I see a couple of questions came in, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive in with some, with some Q&A. To start off, uh, Greg and Matthias, if you could just give us a little bit of your background we're always curious how folks got into filmmaking and, and this type of social impact filmmaking. Uh, and then we'll just, we'll just go from there. Uh, Greg, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Well, <clears throat> I'm American originally. I've lived, I lived in Holland now for about 30 years. I worked in television in, in the U S my father was in the business. So I sort of rolled into it. And then when I came to Holland, I worked for, uh, all the Dutch broadcasters and international broadcasters doing all kinds of stuff. And for about the last 10 years or so, I've been working on my own, producing documentaries and, and whatnot. Fantastic. Uh, and have you, it sounds like social impact film has been part of that. Yeah, that's, that's something that's, that's, uh, I did, I did a lot of stuff for television broadcasters and, uh, then I moved into management and started some companies and then, you know, you, you, you reach a certain age where you think, Okay, you know, I'm heading into the last, last half of my career <laughs> to be yeah. <laughs> polite about it. Oh. And I just, uh, I actually started a nonprofit uh, company in Texas, mm. and the goal is to produce more socially relevant mm. documentaries. The one before this was about soldiers who were poisoned and on military bases, and so that's kind of where where I'm headed. Let's say in this part of my career, it's kind of thing that I like that I like to do, and I think is important to do. Yeah, absolutely. We, we obviously couldn't agree more. That's great. Um, Matthias, can you give us a little background about you? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, this is my first documentary, actually. Hmm. So uh, where Greg has already his whole career passed already. <laughs> and I, uh, I'm just starting. <laughs> You're welcome. You can tell, you can tell we're no, friends. No, I, right? Yeah, <laughs> your, your career's over now. Yeah, we, well, we, by now we, we know each other much, much better than before we, we started uh, filming this documentary. But enough about us. Uh, I, uh, I was, um, I'm uh, in television. I work in television for the past uh, 10 years. And uh, uh, I started as a cameraman and now I'm, uh, I'm a director for television. Hmm. And uh, then I saw Greg in the street and we know each other from, from way back. And then he asked me, uh, are you interested in making a documentary? And I knew already knew Greg has has made several ones. So yeah, we why not? Matthijs and his family live on the same street. Uh, okay. So I've known Matthijs since he was about ten. He and his sisters used to play with my kids and and other neighbors' kids on the street. They kind of all grew up together, and then you know they went off, and Matthijs started his career. So. When he says we bumped into each other on the street, it was not totally random. <laughs> yeah. but he was home visiting his parents, and you know we we kind of kept in touch because we would see each other once in a while when he came home. And then, you know, I knew he was working in television as well. And you know, what are you doing? And what are you doing? And I told him about this idea, and he said, "Well, you know, if you look, if you if you'd like a partner, I would, I'd be interested in participating with you." So that's kind of how we 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 started to do it together. Well, that it sounds like you've had you had a kind of long term rapport and relationship, and uh, and lives close to each other. That's that's really neat. Uh, I wanted to answer kick this off by answering the question that uh, I had that uh, Missy had, who's joining us for the conversation. 
what was the impetus for the film and, and where did the idea begin? How did, how did this project get started? Uh, Greg, let's we'll, we'll start with you. Well, it actually started with me actually, because as I said, I was working on a previous documentary and I was, fin and I was finishing that and I was thinking, okay, you know, what am I gonna do next? And I had read a story in a, in a Texas newspaper many years ago, probably five years ago. It was just like a one page article about this bus station in Huntsville where prisoners walk down the street and they're sort of kind of just dumped to their own fate. Hmm. And I didn't know anything about it. I mean, it really occurred to me at that moment how little you think about hmm. prisoners or jails. Maybe you have a preconceived idea about, you know, well, it's your own fault. You deserve in jail, to be in jail, but it doesn't really go any further than that. So I, I didn't know anything about it. It didn't occur to me at all. What do people do when they get out of jail? Where do they go? And so I saw this story and, and, I, and then I thought, well, if I don't know about it, it's maybe a good chance that a lot of other people don't know about it. And then I started to think about it visually, like maybe this would be an interesting story to tell, but you know, I live here and it was in, back in Texas and you got to figure out how you're going to do it and what kind of a crew and who wants to go there with me. So I kind of thought about it off and on for like a couple of years while I was working on this other documentary. Mm -hmm. And then literally I, I bumped into Matthias on the street one day, literally, I think he was moving his motorcycle. He was walking with his motorcycle, I remember. So I think he was, I don't know, re-parking it or moving it or something. And it just happened to be, well, what do you want to do? Well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I finished this documentary and I told him the story. And it's also very foreign to him being a European. This is not the way they deal with prisoners. So he thought, wow, that could be something that could be really interesting. What do you want to do? I don't know. And he said, well, maybe we could, maybe we could do it together. So he started coming over and we started thinking about it and, and we just decided to do it. Yeah, Matthias, I'd love, love for you if you could build on that. Uh, what was your reaction, as Greg alluded to, being, being European and, and maybe this just the way that America treats its prisoners or, or formerly incarcerated uh, folks? What was your reaction to that as you started diving into the topic? Well, I didn't know, I didn't know much about it, actually. It, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, I had a basic idea about uh, how prisoners are being treated uh, all over the world. Like everybody knows you shouldn't be in prison in Thailand, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I also had an idea before uh, we started this documentary, an idea about the Dutch way of treating, uh, treating prisoners. I think I thought uh, they are they are way too nice for our prisoners in uh, in Holland, mm. but uh, so when we when we left to America, I I thought it should be somewhere in the middle, uh, but I didn't know much about it actually. Mm. Uh, the the whole idea of uh, a bus station next to a prison where all the all the uh, all the prisoners come to who don't have any friends or family waiting for them. That idea that, yeah, I, I don't know, it was just a subject that triggered me and I was like, yeah, let's, let's, let's go for it. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I, Greg, I was wondering if you could, if you could build on that comment from Thais, just around the, the family and friends aspect, that support system that a lot of the men mentioned uh, is something they either had or didn't have. And I know that the, you know, the bus, the bus station manager and bus tents, like they talked about this as well as sort of a determining factor in terms of someone would, uh, you know, be able to be essentially rehabilitated into society or would, or would kind of relapse into the prison system. Was that a theme that, that family support structure, was that a theme that you thought about going into the, to the project or did that emerge through the, through the filming? Well, we knew that there was a, a family waiting area because I had, I had read about that, what it meant exactly, I didn't really know. And I actually thought there would be more people waiting for these guys to get out. There weren't, I mean, there was a one shot you just saw now, and I don't exactly know, but you see maybe 10 people waiting or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, on any given day, there's there's 50 to, to 200 guys who are getting out. So the vast majority of people don't have anybody meeting them. And that kind of surprised me. I sort of figured if it was your your son or your brother, even if you're really pissed off that he's been in jail, you you know, you, you would think you would want to try to help them. But um, we even hear in, in the in the clip you just showed, one guy saying, my mother was supposed to show up and she's just, she's just not here. Mm 
and I don't know why. And um, so that kind of that kind of surprised me. And they, the the man in the waiting area did explain to us that just having somebody being there in, will double or triple your chances of staying out mm. if you have some kind of support system. But most of these guys, first of all, they come from yeah, what we call broken families, right? They come from families that most of them don't have parents. That was, that was something that I always tell people that was really interesting that when you see them making phone calls at the beginning, they're always calling their mother, always. Mm -hmm. Nobody was calling their father. It's always, mom, I just got out. Mom, what am I supposed to do? My mother was supposed to pick me up. Never calling their father. So they, they grow up without this family support system. They have nobody waiting when they get out. And you, you kind of know the chances of them succeeding is pretty small. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was, that was, I think, striking uh, in so many ways. M Matthias, what was your reaction, especially coming, I'm just curiously coming from the, the Netherlands as well, where, you know, if you were thinking about those differences and how families are either structured or, or the number of kind of single parent households that these particular mostly men were, were dealing with, how did, just how did that strike you from a cross-cultural, you know, cross-Atlantic perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I actually I don't know a lot of the difference because in the Netherlands I've I've never been outside of a prison uh, waiting for for men yeah. to come out. But um, at first, when we arrived there, I saw some uh, some uh, um, inmates sitting in front of the bus station, and I got a little bit scared. They were like these bald, tattooed men, strong men that. Uh, that just came out of prison, so I was like, I don't know what they are capable capable of doing. You know, uh, uh, they might be dangerous, or hmm. and it, it's weird that th there was the first day when we arrived there, and we just got out of the car, and I wanted to to get all my stuff out of the car because what if somebody somebody uh, steals steals some stuff from the car? But then uh, uh, during the week, when you learn to know these men they are all very kind i guess and you for totally forget about what they what they have done in the past so uh, at first i was a bit scared i think scared is the right word yeah and and after after a day or two uh they were just people like greg and me who just made a mistake once and now they are in this place that yeah, where they should get out of, but but nobody knows how exactly. Mm. So then it really, it, the subject of the film really hit me mm. at the first time when we were there. So, yeah. Yeah, so you were affected by it, um, which we hear a lot, actually, filmmakers that are uh, impacted by the by their own topic that they're, <laughs> that they're filming about in a really deep way. Yeah, you just realize, you realize what the film is about mm -hmm. when you, when you, when you're there filming it. Mm -hmm. So at first we we thought, uh, let's make a film about this bus station and about this bus station manager. And it's very interesting, the story she has to tell. Mm -hmm. But then uh, ex it expanded a bit to across the street where the volunteers were and uh, and uh, the family waiting area Greg was already, already talking about. Mm -hmm. So then I think maybe Greg had a clearer image in his mind at first. I, I'm, I'm not sure. But for me, that then at that point, the film started to... Yeah, to evolve that. Well, it is kind of, it is kind of weird because, as Matthijs said, they, they were all friendly to us, mm. and you know we would go back at, and have dinner at the end of the day, and we would say, yeah, you know, of course they're going to be in their best behavior today. It's their first day out; they're not going to cause any trouble. But some of them would even joke with us, or some of them were scared, like the one older man who said, I'm, I, "I function better in prison," and. He was very scared, but very willing to tell us his, his emotion. Hmm. Um, and, but then you can, and I don't think this is a good thing now, but you can go on the Texas registry online and you can see what these people have did. We purposely didn't ask when we were there hmm. what their crime was. Some of them told us, but we mostly didn't talk about what the crime was. And hmm. then you find out what they did. And then you start to think, oh yeah, you know, these are not really nice people. Hmm. Yeah, and you forget about that, and you, but you see them as, you see them as nice people. At that moment, they yeah. seem the same, really. They seem decent and nice, and then you think, yeah, 
is it now over? Did they really, are they rehabilitated? Are they changed? Is it over now? I mean, some of them were sex offenders. Hmm. And, and you think, ooh, that's kind of gross. And, but are they, are they cured? Are they fixed? Are they rehabilitated? How are they ever going to get back into society? And then, I, you know, you start to think about, and now we were just talking about it before. We did an interview with a newspaper before, and we were talking about, and these guys are now getting out at the worst time ever with corona. They're, they're never going to get a job. They're never, I mean, they're now at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. Mm. How are they going to, and there's no system in place at all. Mm. And I was always one of those people that thought, if you're in jail, it's your own fault and you deserve to rot in jail. And now I think a little bit more about, you know, you're not, you're not born a criminal. You, you, you turn into a criminal and then you pay your time and there's no help for these guys at all. I mean, they're literally just dumped on the street. Why, why is it so shocking that they commit another crime or go back again? Right. Right. You, it's almost not. I mean, with the levels of risk yeah. that we see and the, and like you documented the, the, the volunteers. I mean, these are really just volunteers that yeah. uh, are out there that are giving their own time and there's no sort of systemic structure in place. To and this is not even the worst because I don't know if you remember, mm -hmm. one guy said, I've been out of jail three times and I've never got a bus ticket, never got a piece of pizza. He was specifically talking about Arizona. So he's, it's even even worse than this. Some states you just literally dumped on the street and that's it. Wow. Uh, we've gotten a couple of questions uh, for you guys from uh, Karen and Leanne with similar themes around sort of the focus of the project. Cause you talked about, I think Matthias mentioned sort of the evolution. It's not like it evolved a little bit in terms of what, who you would focus on or what story you might tell. Uh, Leanne asked if you knew from the beginning what angle of the documentary it would be and whether you thought you might focus on the crimes that these men have committed or the li their lives after prison. And Karen had a similar question about, did you think about sort of following up with the men and seeing kind of what happened later? Um, if, or if that might be a whole nother film, sort of seeing what, what, what their lives have become. Uh, Matthias, we'll start with you. Well, uh, I thought at the beginning, I thought I knew what, what the film was going to be about. And in the end, it, it, it worked out uh, that way a little bit. But at first we wanted to, to call it um, Bus Stop or we had like a working title, Bus Stop. But it's a lot more uh, than just a bus stop. So uh, then it evolved like, uh, like the person you saw uh, at the end of the screening, like the guy who is pointing out where the bus station is. Um, that's all happening in that street. So we, we just wanted to document everything that's happening in that street then after all. And also because, uh, because family was, um, or is a, a, a very important part of staying out of prison. So we had to film the family waiting area as well, of course. So no, in the beginning, I, I, I didn't know exactly what we were going to see or going to film. But also, it was my first time in America, so I, I had no idea, actually. Quite an introduction to, to the US. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Greg, go ahead. Well, I think we, knew, we did discuss in the beginning that we weren't going to talk about the crime, because we didn't think that was important anymore. And we did talk a lot about if we wanted to follow up afterwards. Hmm. But then I think we thought a couple of things. First of all, afterwards is a very long time mm. because it's going to take a long time, like we said, before they ever get a job or whatever, get out. We did, so we did decided we wanted the uh, sort of the open end. We wanted to focus sort of open because that we, we decided that was really the focus of the story we wanted to tell. They get out and what's going to happen now? Where are they going to go? And that's basically the point because they don't know what they're going to do where they're going to go and what's going to happen. And that's kind of the, the idea that we wanted to focus on. Of course, sometimes now we think, whatever happened to that guy? I wonder what happened to that guy. Uh, wonder how it turned out. And now with Corona, you know, mm. it, it, it might've been interesting to follow them. But yeah, like you said, that's a whole nother story, I think. And it, and it would have been longer. And uh, I don't know if you could ever finish a story like that because when does it ever end? Right. I mean, you know, I don't know, but so we decided to focus on the open end for better or worse. 
I do know that sometimes we get comments from people that say, yeah, I want to know what happened to him or what happened to him. But maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. They feel that. Right, it gets people talk, talking and thinking yeah. about this issue and about the people involved in it. Yeah. Uh, you, you raised, a, 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 a quite, I think, an issue just now, Greg, that came up in, as we watched the film on our team, which is around personal responsibility. Um, you know, it was it was brought up by I think one of the one of the sort of volunteers that were out there um, talking about you know the, that corner and that decision that men make whether they go to you know buy buy drinks or they, they get on the bus. Um, could could you both talk just about that the, the, that theme of personal responsibility? Kind of what struck you um, from the film on that on that topic, and maybe more broadly how it connects to. Uh, you know the challenges of the criminal justice system in the U.S. If you've given some thought to 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 that, uh, Matthias, I'll let you start. Um, maybe you can start with Greg. I didn't I didn't oh, catch okay. the, the question. No it's a deep question. It's a deep question. It's a deep question. Yeah. It's really just about sort of how personal responsibility plays into you know uh, uh, right. criminal justice reform, but also just the the decisions that individuals make, right? Um, you had that really, I think, dramatic and poignant moment of, of the corner, you know, where, yeah. where men are deciding which way, literally to which way, which path they will take with their life as they as they exit prison. Well, we, I think uh, that's also what Elroy said. Everybody has their own uh, responsibility. And also, um, uh, if you want to, if you want to stay out, you can do it if you, if you really want it. That's what, what Elroy says, and I, I do believe him, but a lot of circumstances uh, has to help. And mm -hmm. also what we talked about earlier, uh, when you get out of prison and nobody's waiting for you, you have no place to go to, you have no, uh, after, after being in prison for 20 years, you don't have any close friends or uh, maybe you have family, but if they aren't waiting for you, maybe they, they, they aren't willing to help you as well. Mm -hmm. So what are you what are you supposed to do what are you going to what are you going to do then and that's i think a lot of a lot of it has to do with your own mentality and your own choices but if you're if you're left with no other choice than to go back into being a criminal mm -hmm. i i think uh there's no other option for some of these guys there's no other option than to go back into being a criminal so that's very sad right yeah a lot of them feel like they do kind of trapped without that support and and but at that corner at that corner if they go to the right and they start mm -hmm. buying drinks from the money they get from the prison yeah sure of course they that's like the 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 fastest wrong wrong uh option you can make yeah 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 greg did you want to build on that well, it's it's true. They have their own they have their own responsibility. But it, like I said before, I was I'm a little less black and white than I was when I when I first went because you know I would even ask some of them point point blank, why are you in prison and I'm not? I mean, what's what's the difference? And some of them, well, actually, all of them. It was really funny. Actually, it was really interesting because they had, like Matthias said, some of them are these big guys, ball with tattoos. And they would always say, love. We didn't, we didn't have any love. We, we had no support growing up. We had no family growing up. And a lot of them would also say, that's not uh, a reason, or it's not the fault, but it is a reason. It's not a coincidence, like I said before, that they, none of these people have fathers. They're all from broken homes. And they, uh, they still have choices, but the choices are different. You know, I just, I grew up in a middle-class house. I went to school and went home and goofed off with my friends and that was it. You know, we can't imagine the environment that some of these people come from. Mm. And like Matthias said, they're all, you know, they all mean well, I think. <laughs> they all say that we're never coming back. We're never going to learn my lesson. We're never coming back. Then why do they, why do so many of them go back? It can't always be that they decide I'm going to go back to jail, though some of them are more comfortable in jail. I just think we all, I, I, I think everybody has responsibility. Let's put it that way. They have responsibility, but so do we as a society to try to, to make, we have to make a decision. Either 
we believe that these are rotten, evil people and they should be locked up, or they did a rotten, evil thing, they, they served their penalty, and now we should help them rehabilitate into society and maybe some of them will do good. I think there's responsibility on both sides, to be honest with you. Yeah, and on that on that point of societal responsibility, Miss, you asked, uh, I think, a really good question about how this film uh, could be used to spur criminal justice reform in the United States, specifically working with congressional or state legislators or other or other groups. Uh, Matthias, I'm wondering if you could kick off that conversation, which obviously can go in many different directions. Um, as you probably well know, there's been a bipartisan effort, at least in Congress, to do some to make some changes. We'll see if those actually happen, whether that's you know, employment issues after prison or recidivism or kind of earlier in the cycle, as Greg mentioned, of folks in the households that they, the kind of support they have or don't have in their households. Can you just talk about what reform issues, if any, came out of the film and how you might use this film for, um, to spur reform? Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully people can, can see, well, personally, I, I saw, um, uh, the, those prisoners as uh, just as humans, you know, just as the men they were. And without, of course, everybody walked out of prison, so they have done something bad. And some of them were in there for like 30 years. So they have done something really bad. But I don't know, when, when, we, when, we, when we were there, we were talking to them, we saw them as the men that, who they are and just as humans, and uh, they have they have made a big mistake, of course. But whenever they they got out of prison, they weren't free at all. They were still uh, struggling to to rehabilitate to to society, right? So I think that's I don't know in what way this film can help, but maybe it can help. Uh, uh, see these people as humans and as people that that need some help to go back in in society although they they have made a big mistake they you know they they did their time and they uh they have to have to get into society one way or another right so hopefully hopefully people will see them as a i don't know I, I, just as as people instead of X convicts or something like that. Right, or just this, you know, statistics that there, there's just X number of people that right, yeah, fall back into the system and vice versa. Uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on on using the film for reform efforts, or if there's particular policy reforms that that stand out to you? Well, I think everything starts with knowledge. You know, there's a lot of people who don't even know that this is happening. The, the previous documentary I made was about soldiers who were poisoned on American bases in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the, the number one thing I heard when people saw that documentary was they didn't, need, they didn't know anything about it. And I was invited by a senator to come to Washington and show it to other congressmen and senators and their aides. And a lot of people didn't even know it was even happening. Hmm. So the first thing you have to do is you have to create awareness. People have to know that something like this is happening. If it's actually going to create change, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a lot of faith in, in government, unfortunately, certainly well, <laughs> certainly this government, <laughs> but, uh, and if I noticed that with this, uh, with this other documentary with the soldiers, it helped, it created awareness, but it just, it's, it's like a slow moving train, trying them, trying to get anything and especially anything done, anything changed. And especially like this situation, like I just mentioned that the situation in Texas is different than the situation is in Arizona. That means what, every state has to make their own decisions. And I don't know, you know, I, I hope, like Matthias said, I hope that we can create awareness, that we can find a broadcast partner, for example, who will bring it to a large audience so that the first people Who's, who's uh, first people first for the first time realize that this is even happening. Because I know everybody that we've shown it to, they didn't even know this existed. Right. They didn't know that. Yeah, you don't really think, like I said before, what happens to prisoners, you don't know. And a lot of people are even shocked that this happens, that they're literally just dumped on the street. And like the scene in the one, the one scene with the guys at the bus station, he says, I got to go to Galveston. 
And and Elroy says, you're going to Houston. Yeah, but I have to go to Galveston. Yeah, too bad. That's your problem. You've been in jail for 20 years. You don't know how to get from one place to another. Mm. And maybe somebody who's in the position can become aware and think, hey, we have to, we have to change this. We have to provide some kind of system to try to get these people. I mean, some of them are going to halfway houses, but let's face it, what mm. we all know what halfway houses are like. And they would even talk about that when they get to Houston, they get a halfway house, the drug dealers are standing out the ha- outside the halfway house waiting for them. Mm. Stuff like that has to be eliminated. We have to find some way to, 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 to help these people or it's just, it's just gonna get worse and worse and worse. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think you you really tackle like a specific part of the criminal justice kind of issue that maybe a lot of folks don't think about or to your point aren't aware of at all, which is just that that literal experience of leaving prison. Um, Matthias, I'm wondering if you've been in touch with any non you know other nonprofit organizations or um, you know legislators have reached out. Have you heard from other groups that want to work on this particular challenge as you've shared the film? Or has it just been folks becoming aware, to Greg's point, for the first time of the issue? No, I haven't. I haven't been in touch with uh, with with uh, uh, with organizations like that. Um, we just started the the film, but we just finished the film, and we're we're there's very few people that have even seen it yet. Oh wow! Okay. And some other film. We're just starting to enter it into film festivals, and I mean, friends, some friends and family have seen it but nobody yet that's in a position to do anything. I, I mean, like I said, we've literally just started. I mean, I think we finished it maybe a month ago and we just started entering film festivals. And so it's just now starting that, that, prop, that, that, uh, that process. Yeah, we'd love to see if we can be helpful in any of that work as you, as you, if, you, if you think about you know, connecting with other nonprofits or-, or uh, Yeah, I mean, anything you can do, or if you know anybody at PBS or Netflix or- Yeah, yeah, we should <laughs> anybody, talk. Anything like that. <laughs> yeah, we can do. If you uh, want to reach obviously the best, the biggest audience yeah. that, we, that we can, of course. Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, we're we're all behind you on that. Uh, my last question, and, and again, if folks have other questions, feel free to send them in. Um, my last question was just wanted to wanted to kind of know what you what you both are working on next, if anything in particular, and uh, and kind of what's what's coming down the pipe. Well, I'll go first. Greg, go ahead. Nothing yet. <laughs> nothing yet. Okay, okay Matthias. <laughs> well, nothing, nothing like this documentary. I'm just working like uh, like. Everybody else, I think. Okay. So pretty, I'm working on a on a next television show in uh, in Holland. Sorry. No, I was just saying. Matthijs is a pretty popular, busy director in Holland. He doesn't he doesn't lag work. That's cool. And I, but because I I want to focus specifically on a niche, you know, I'm looking for another documentary, another socially relevant story to tell. Love that. Uh, well, we'd love to have you both, you know, kind of staying part of our community and, and, and in touch and we can, if we can help in any way, we'd be happy to do that. So, uh, thanks again to you both for sharing the film today. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. We're really excited to, uh, celebrate 12th street with, with Greg and Matthias. So, uh, looking forward to see what you do next as you hopefully collaborate again together. Um, Greg Matthias, thanks again for your, for joining us. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you too. Thanks. Thanks so much.